back again. It's Hebrews in Exile with Rabbi Robert B. Holman Jr. and Sean Appleton. In episode number 33, we are going to discuss the mitzvot. What are the mitzvot? They're simply the commandments of the Most High, the statutes, the regulations, and the rules for the Most High's community. We'll discuss the importance of the mitzvot and why they are applicable to the Hebrew in exile. There's going to be a lot of good discussion. Sit tight. Don't go anywhere. Grab a cup of coffee. You're in for a great ride today. This is Hebrews in Exile. Let's go. Rabbi Robert B. Holman Jr. and Donald Trump. No, this is Sean Appleton. I knew that was going to get a rise <laughs> out of you. You stopped <laughs> in the middle of what you were oh, saying. Oh, man. Come on now. This is, this is Hebrews <laughs> in, in exile. exile. There is a very important facet of the way of the Hebrew life that is essential to our faith, and what we believe. And that that centers around the mitzvahs. Yeah, the commandments of the Most High. Mm -hmm. The mitzvahs come in three categories, precepts, ordinance, and regulations. Mm. And they're essential to, they, they are the governance by which Israel is to live by in harmony with the Most High. Right. The Ashkenazis and the Sephardics have deemed that there are 613. Supposedly. And that mm -hmm. number breaks down into a number of positives and negative mm -hmm. mitzvot, which are... 613 is the number of components that make make up man physically by virtue of bone, sinew, and what have you. Mm -hmm. However, I'm currently <laughs> teaching the mitzvot in our congregation, and I have pulled up several of the references that reference the mitzvot, and none of them are in sync with each other. Right. There's a discrepancy. So if yeah. none of them are in sync with each other, then obviously 613 is not a correct number. Mm -hmm. Not only is it not a correct number, but there are mitzvot that the Most High has given that are not on any of the lists that I have read through that mm. and or books Mm -hmm. uh, that define the 613 misfolds. Yeah, it's good to hear. Good, yeah. Now, why are these misfolds important? Because the Most High says, if you will obey my commandments, my rulings, and my misfolds, he says, he says, this shall be a way of life for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So life, life, actual life, and we're talking about inhaling and exhaling and we're talking about the aspect of being able to reside with the most high in the messianic era which is the seventh day in the land are contingent upon our understanding the application of the mitzvot to our lives correct yes there are mitzvot that are germane specifically to the kohanim and mm -hmm. the temple which cannot be adhered to in exile. Correct. However, there are regulations, there are ordinance and precepts that the Most High has given us by which that we can apply them in, in this exile and live by them and practice them in this exile. Correct. So that we get familiar with them, so that when we get in the land, there won't be any discrepancy in our minds concerning the most high's mitzvah. Now, what you have to understand mm -hmm. is that in the seventh day of the messianic era, the mitzvahs, all of the mitzvahs are going to be in play. Right. Uh, the temple will be restored. Uh, animal sacrificing will be restored. Oh, what? 
<laughs> I thought I thought Hebrew says animal sacrifices and offerings he did not desire. Well, yeah, that's what the Greeks said. Right. That's right. Now, I got to tell you, and I say this over and over and over and over again. The Greeks have no authority to change or alter anything that the Most High has said. Correct. Yeah. And your your explanation in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse... Oh, it's in the latter part of it. Let's just go in the middle, like 15, somewhere And it there. says... And it says that the Torah and the... Well, the Torah, or in the, in the Greek Bible, probably says the law, is weak and ineffective and did not accomplish its goal. Now, I want you to think about that. Because what the Greeks are saying is that what the Most High gave to the nation of Israel is weak <laughs> and ineffective. You're telling me that the Elohim who says, I am not human, I am not of humankind, that I should lie or change my mind, has given to the nation of Israel, the governance for the nation, and you're going to tell me that what the Most High gave the nation of Israel is weak and ineffective, the gall of you. Right. And on top of that, to have the nerve to have what you call as sin is missing the mark based on all of those mitzvot. So I guess... Let's take an easy one. I guess stealing and coveting and is weak and ineffective. And I guess sleeping with your mother and sleeping with your sister is ineffective. Right. So I guess this is how they can establish, you know, it's been done away with. We don't have to do it anymore because it's weak. It didn't accomplish its goal, which was what was the goal in the first place? Obviously to, for us, it's a way of living. It's a way of understanding that the Most High wants, or like you said, a lifestyle for us to live. And it's not that the scriptures and the misfolks are weak and ineffective. I would contend that the people are weak because at every turn, there is no no way that you can say what has been spoken out of the most uh, out of the mouth of the Most High through His servant Moshe, who has established that for us. Uh. Any of them are are at a point where you can't, where they're not effective, I should say. I'm, it sounds like I'm rambling a little bit, but I mean, I'm just at a loss for just, I'm just shocked at how egregious that verse is. Let's, let's, just, let's just read this out for a minute. All right. So if I go to Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 27, and... I look at what the Most High is saying to Mashe, and he's saying to proclaim to every man of Israel that curse a curse on anyone who makes a carved or metal image, something Yahweh detests, the handiwork of a craftsman, and sets it up in secret is weak and ineffective. Hmm. Uh, to dishonor your father and mother is weak and ineffective. Mm. Uh, to interfere with justice for the foreigner, the orphan, or the widow is weak and ineffective. To have sexual relationships with your father's wife uh, is weak and ineffective to have sexual relationships with any kind of animal is weak and ineffective. Um, yeah, what is weak about to that? To have sexual relationships with your sister or your sister's daughter uh, is weak and ineffective. <laughs> uh, to have sexual relationships with your mother-in-law is weak and ineffective. Um, uh to accept bribes to kill an innocent person is weak and ineffective. And that's just 
That's just, just some of them. That's just some of them. So now, the Hebrew text says that it was all weak and ineffective and didn't bring Israel to the goal. Mm -hmm. But these principles that I've just read are what the Most High has established as being the strength of Israel, which established the moral fiber of Israel to keep Israel in a state of holiness. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to talk about some mitzvahs today, tonight. I'm going to tell you something. It dawned on me that the best thing, if at all, that Christianity does mm -hmm. is make you a better moral person because it can't save you. Correct. Right. Ex absolutely. And if it does anything at all, it makes you a better moral person mm -hmm. because now what you used to do that was immoral, supposedly Jesus saved you from that. So now he's, cleaned up your moral fiber. Right. Yeah, kind of in a but, weird way. Yeah. But by Torah standard, salvation and deliverance mm -hmm. has nothing to do with going to heaven. Mm -hmm. It has to do with preparing you to have a successful livelihood in the seventh day when he redeems you, because redemption is quantitative. Correct. Redemption mm -hmm. is about redeeming people from redeeming uh, the uh, the um, kinsman redeemer. Mm -hmm. It's about land. Right. Uh, redemption of Israel from the plight of Pharaoh. That's quantitative in mm -hmm. the land of Mitzrayim. Mm -hmm. All of that, when you study the aspect of the word redemption from its Hebraic perspective, it's quantitative and it's associated with something that actually happens that you can put your, you can put your, you can put your mind and wrap your mind around. Right. When you talk about Jesus redeemed you from sin, that's not quantitative. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And that's because, that's because you're still a sinner under the, in the eyes of the most high. And that's because the Most High says that breaking his commandments is a sin. Mm -hmm. And if you're if you are walking in Sunday worship, that's idolatry, that's a sin, so you're still a sinner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he says that anybody in, in Exodus chapter 31, uh, verse 12 or so, he says, anybody who does not honor my Shabbat and treats it as though it were uh, nothing shall be put to death. Correct. Correct. So I think what we're trying to establish here is the gravitas of the mitzvot. They are very much a part of the fiber of not only being Hebrew, but understanding in the days to come. When we get into the land, they're going to be very much in play. So this dispensation of time is kind of like what you, that that I, Allen Iverson thing that you that you talk about. Yeah, yeah. is this this uh, we're talking this about pra practice? practice? We're talking about practice. <laughs> now, here's the other narrative that you have to wrap your mind around. The message that this podcast is trying to portray to you are the things that we talk about are solely, solely, solely mm. directed to Hebrew Israel. It is not directed to the nations. Correct. The Most High says that the nations are but a drop in the bucket to him. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you can't argue with me about things that are trying to be systemic and connected the Hebrew over to the Greek narrative because those two systems are diabolically opposed to each other. The question always is going to come to be, what did the Most High say? Correct. Correct. And who is he speaking to? to? He's speaking to Hebrew, ethnic Hebrew Israel, the nation of Israel. He's not talking to any other nation. And if the other nations want to join with Israel, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. But they're going to have, to have to adopt to the rules and regulations that reside. Let's, let's, let's take a, a classic example. Yeah. So you move to this country from another country. Mm -hmm. 
You can't come into this country and live by the rules of the country that you came out of. That's true. And I'm going to add to that because let's say, for instance, because I looked into this a little bit because I said, you know, our goal here is the kind, I don't want to say our goal, I'm saying my goal in the near future, um, you know, is to travel abroad and I'm looking at other countries that maybe have citizenship in. And when you look at that, where you have to go, there is kind of like, quote unquote, an entrance exam. And the same thing with the United States. You have to be educated on the history of that country and its rulings prior to gaining your citizenship to that place. So if we apply that same type of ruling here. When you come over here to, to the Hebraic way of thought, you have to understand the mitzvot, and there are mitzvot that are specific to the foreigner that abide with Hebrew Israel. Yes. And you must be educated on that in order to be able to function in it properly. You can't bring your way of life right. from another country into this country. You can't bring your rules and regulations and live by your rules and regulations in America. And what we're talking about, what these mitzvahs, mitzvahs are germane to, they're germane to the nation of Israel mm -hmm. only. Absolutely. And how Israel is supposed to live in mm -hmm. the land and also in this exile. Right. How to conduct ourselves. Just because we're in this exile, we're not 100% we're not exempt from the mitzvahs that the Most High has given us to function and live by. So we need we need to understand what they are so we can separate the ones that are germane to the priestly order, mm -hmm. the coining order, which can only be done in the land, mm -hmm. uh, versus those that are precepts and ordinances for us out of the land right. in this exile. Absolutely. And the Most High puts kind of like in bold the ones that are, now they're all important, but he kind of reemphasizes some of them by saying, using these words, these are going to be a permanent regulation throughout your generations. To say, you know, most of them that say that literally are ones that are germane, like you said, that we can do to this day, that are not exclusive to just being in the land or having to be a part of the Kohanim mortar. Now, I'm just going to, I'm going to go through just just a few of just a few of them as I talk about them tonight, uh, in in this podcast, in uh, Vaikra, that's Exodus chapter eighteen, yes. Leviticus, Leviticus rather, Leviticus, Vaikra, uh, chapter eighteen, verse two. Uh, he gives us a misful that is the prohibition to engage in activities of the nations that violate Yahweh's mitzvahs. All right. So he's telling you, I'm going to exile you, but there are mitzvahs that the nations have that violate my mitzvahs, mm. and you are not to participate in those. Mm-hmm. And he speaks in these verse. He says, speak to the people of Israel. Tell them, I am Yahweh, your Eloheka. You are not to engage in the activities found in the land of Mitraim where you used to live, and you're not to engage in the activities found in the land of Kenanon where I am bringing you, nor are you to live by their laws. Mm. Now, we are in exile, and there are laws that have been past in the lands where we live that violate the principles of the most highest mitzvahs. Okay. I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you one that's specific. All right. One that's specific is that the most high has told us that a man is not to have sexual relations with a man as with a woman and a woman is not to have sexual relations with a woman as with a man. Right. And clearly... United States. And he least. says, and he says, that is an abomination to me. I hate that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, and here in the U.S., that's been put into law, I guess. Yeah, it's been put into law. And the, um, the fundamental Christians are screaming their head off because that law has been passed. But then the fundamental Christians don't understand that they are still in violation of Torah while you're screaming about an LGBT law of homosexuality engagement 
which is an abomination to the Most High, you still eating ham, shrimp, crab, oyster, uh, uh, shrimp, and and all the all the foods that the Most High says He hates is an abomination to Him. So you can't have it both ways. Either you know you you can't have it both ways. Wait a minute. I thought is that a part of the myths, folks, that are weak and ineffective that 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 are that don't mean anything? Yeah. So I guess over, the position it's, of- o- it's over in Leviticus chapter number eleven. The misfos that are weak and ineffective, and the issue is that even your even your dietitians, oh yeah, will tell you that the most high misfos on his food laws are are more healthy for you than the, than what the nations have provided for you. Absolutely, absolutely, you just can't. But but what the most high says is weak and ineffective. <laughs> <laughs> you eating pig and carrying a carrying a tapeworm in you a mile long as you don't even know exists in your body, but the, what the Most High said is weak and ineffective. Right, that's a dichotomy that's hard for them to the nations to explain away. I mean, the gall, the gall of them to even to even you know come up with that kind of thing. But you know what? You know what? I I I right. I, I, I got I gotta go there. Go, come you, on, you know, you know, you're I got, right you there. Know, you know, you know, <laughs> you're at the I, doorstep. You know, you're knocking you know, on the you know, door. You know, I got to go there. <laughs> In John, chapter six, and verse fifty-three in the Greek text, this is what Jesus says. Then Yeshua said to them, "Yes, indeed, I tell you that unless you eat my flesh and." of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you do not have any life in yourselves. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. That is, I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have, and I live through the Father, also whoever eats me will, will live through me. That is the biggest mm. cockamony <laughs> BS that has ever been written that violates the complete premise of what the Father has said in his word. Right. He doesn't want you eating or drinking it, any of that. It violates, it violates the whole premise of Torah, which brings me to the point to ask a question. So it says that he was obedient unto death on the cross. Obedient to who and to what? Because he certainly isn't obedient to Torah, not with a statement like that. Correct. So now let's look at the mitzvah that the Most High has said applies to this situation. It's in Vayikra chapter 17 and verse number uh, 10. Mm -hmm. Whenever someone from the community of Israel, once again, who we talk from the community of Israel, he ain't talking about the nation, from the community of of Hebrew Israel, Mm -hmm. or one of the foreigners living with you eats any kind of blood, I will set myself against that person who eats blood and cut him off from his people. I want to stop right there. I want to stop right there. I want to stop right there with the words, cut him off from his people. Cut off from his people is not like going into a herd of cattle and cutting the bad cattle out from the good cattle. Yeah, much more than that. That's not what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. When the Most High says, you will be cut off from your people. He's saying that you will no longer exist. Mm. Now, with that being the case, there is another aspect that is associated with Greek mythology that's part of a movie called Dante's Inferno. That was about the... um, And that is the aspect of anybody 
going to hell mm. and living in this eternal fire that's going to burn forever and ever and never be quenched. That's so Greek. Mm. Mm-hmm. Is Torah, that the whole, whole purgatory narrative is in there? Torah, Torah has no conversation about anybody going to heaven as a, going to hell. As a matter of fact, the Most High says, "I do not find any pleasure mm-hmm. in Ezekiel in the destruction of the wicked." Mm. So he's not getting any pleasure out of you suffering eternally in a hell. Mm. Better, he does you a favor, and it's a great favor by causing you to simply not exist. It's like it's like removing an app from your laptop mm-hmm. or from your computer. You move it out on the desktop, and it goes poof. It no it's, longer exists. It no longer exists, yeah. That, my friends, I want to tell you something. That's the Most High's mercy. Mm. That's good mercy. That's his mercy. So, now, let's get back to this. He says, From the community, anyone from the community of Israel or a foreigner living with you who eats any kind of blood will be, I will set myself against that person who eats blood and cut him off from the people for the life of the creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for yourselves. For it is the blood that makes atonement because of the life. This is why I told the people of Israel, none of you is to eat blood, nor is any foreigner living with you to eat blood. I'm going to say the state. I'm going to give you the scripture text again. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10. So now if we read this mitzvot, the question is, what is Jesus talking about in John 6, 53? Yeah, why is he making that statement to say? And... Uh, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. <laughs> no, they don't. Right. So we can honestly say that the people that actually heard that and turned around and left were in the right. Now that's 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 an interesting that's an interesting uh, uh, perception mm-hmm. because now the next question is you have to ask yourself is they left? Well, why did they leave? Listen. Do you think Hebrew Israel is stupid? Not at all. We may be we may we may <laughs> go after idolatry and stuff like that, but there are some principles in Torah that we hold on to that we knew were true. And mm-hmm. remember, there was two religious sects at the time that he was going around spewing all this Torah negativism. And mm-hmm. that was the Pharisees, the Pharisees, mm-hmm. which the Christians want to talk about the Pharisees. No, <laughs> the Pharisees were one of the most, one of the most fundamental sects of Torah in the land, and the Sadducees were second. Mm-hmm. But the that the Pharisees were more were more astute and attuned to Torah than any other group of people in Jerusalem in the days that this man was walking around in sandals. That's right. And the and the people, the people knew what Torah said. The people knew that Vayikra chapter seventeen verse seven verse ten was in play. Mm-hmm. So when they heard that, yeah, they go, oh, <laughs> <laughs> like this is not right. We're gonna leave before Ex- the ground open up like for Korak. Excuse me, I'm not trying to be vulgar, but H dash 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 dash. <laughs> H dash 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 is in play. No. <laughs> and they left. Right. Right. And rightly so. We heard that same narrative too. We would have turned around and walked in the other direction. And they walked in the other direction because they knew that was a violation. Mm-hmm. However, however, now watch this. There are principles that are germane to the aspect of eating flesh but not blood. Mm -hmm. Because when you go to, um, when you go to, 
when you go to uh, Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 27, this is what the Most High says. And he's giving, and you have to read chapter 26 uh, to get the whole narrative of what of how the Most High feels about Israel uh, not abiding by his mitzvot. He says, and if for all this you still will not listen to me, but you go against me, then I will go against you furiously mm. and also chastise you yet seven times more for your sins. Mm. You will eat the flesh of your own sons. You will eat the flesh of your own daughters. So now Yeshua's son, except you drink my blood and eat my flesh. Well, over here in 27 of Vayikra, eating flesh was a punishment to Israel for going against the Most High. It was not something glorious to look forward to. And mm -hmm. the Most High supports it and backs it up in Jeremiah's writing in the book of Lamentations. Mm. Mm hmm. You know what I'm fiddling with over here? What? I'm twitching over here in my seat. Still twitching with, with <laughs> weak and ineffective? I'm still twitching with the weak and ineffective. And I, I think probably for me, if not for both of us, I need to make a clarification and say and reiterate what you said earlier. Is this the re Why are we even over here in this idolatrous part of this book called the Bible? Because that New Testament has got a lot of stuff in it that's not right with the most high Absolutely. because a lot there's a lot of hebrew israel that's stuck over there yes and the aim again for this podcast you say well you know why are you bothering if this is strictly for hebrew israel then we should be over here in 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 the tanakh teaching the tanakh because our aim is for the people yes and you have a mind that's being manipulated yes. and institutionalized yes and you need to hear the word of the Most High to get us back into right standing. Yes. We could end all this tomorrow. If the nation would cry out as they did in the book of Judges and turn back to the Most High, this exile, <laughs> this butt whooping, all this egregious action that we're suffering from the nations could end overnight. Right. He would come on a cloud. And he would deliver us, as Daniel says, he would come on a cloud and deliver us out of this misery that we're in. And we could be into a glorious seventh day in the land, worshiping with our king, King David, right. who in the Most High said, he is my anointed. He is my, he is my Moshiach king forever. Right. So our reasoning and logic is to meet you where you are. And say, look at this logically and weigh it against the creator of the universe who said, this is what I want for my people. Here's Period. a question. Here's a question. What authority does any individual that bleeds red blood, puts his draws on <laughs> one leg at a time, right. have to change what the most high who created all things, has put in place, who said, I'm not a human being that I should lie or change my mind. What human being has the wavels to say that what the Most High said is weak, ineffective, and doesn't apply? That's that's wavels, man. That's that's <laughs> that's, that's 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 wavel. That's 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 huge. <laughs> right. I mean, you you can't. Make I'm it sorry, more but plain I, I, I can't. I can't put it. I I I I I can't put it in any other language <laughs> that you would understand. <laughs> right. That's that's bold. Yeah, that takes a lot of <laughs> Yiddish a chutzpah to to do something like that <clears throat> and then stand behind it. <clears throat> now. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33 and verse 25, the Most High says to his prophet Ezekiel, Therefore, tell them that Yahweh Elohim says, You eat flesh with blood. You raise your eyes to your idols, and you shed blood, and you still expect to possess the land? Mm. <laughs> this is what the Most High says. Right. 
the but, creator of your universe. Yeah, but but we we go we gonna we're gonna negate what the Elohim who created you, right? Who has the right to say, "I brought you into this world, and I take I can take you out." Right. That he changed the whole narrative. Right. No, he did not. And he did not send a man in flesh to act for him. He does. Another question for you. <laughs> if the Most High is omniscient, omnipresent, why would he have to send somebody in flesh to call themselves him to act for him? Mm. And, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Watch this. I got to watch my mouth. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Who, what human being has the right to whip up on God? None. You won't give him 40 lashes. What human being has the right to whip up, to, 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 to slash a whip upon the spirit of the Most High? Right. Hello. A good, excellent point. Hello. And put a crown on the head of the Most High who's supposed to be representing the Most High. Who has that kind of authority? Mm. No one has that authority. Let me answer it for you. Nobody. Nobody. Say it again. Nobody. Absolutely <laughs> nobody. <laughs> nobody. Which, I mean, again, we study the Most High. We try to study the character of the Most High, what the Most High wants of his people, what he likes and what he dislikes. And nowhere prior to this has the Most High ever offered a sacri human sacrifice for anything. You could say he came close when Avram took his son, Yitzhak, up there to be sacrificed, but his hand was stayed from that. He stopped it. That's the closest you're going to get. As close as you're going to get. And there's a backstory as to why that even happened. Yes, yes. And but never in the tomes of history have we ever seen the Most High do this. And no. so out of the blue, if he's not going to accept a human sacrifice, why would he sacrifice himself? Oh, For man. people. You know, you know, you know, he was <laughs> in exile. I know you might think that we sound radical, but we're not. We're simply expressing the, the truth that resides within the word of the Father that he has spoken. Um, I'm sorry to say this to you, but Hebrew Israel has an obligation to abide by the mitzvot and the rulings, the precepts, and the regulations that the Most High has given to them because they are a nation and every nation has rules, has rules, and it has governance. Mm -hmm. We, the Hebrew nation is not a democracy. It is a theocracy. It's correct. And it has a king. Mm -hmm. And the king of Israel happens to be Yahweh. He said it in the book of Yeshayahu. You can start reading in chapter 54, uh, 44, and you can read down 44 into 45, and you're going to see him saying, I am your king, I am your redeemer, I am your savior, and beside me, there is no other. <clears throat> you're going to hear him say, I am the first, I am the last, and I do not know any alien Elohim, no alien God. Clear, cut and dry. So getting back to this blood thing, mm -hmm. when we look at what I've just read to you out of Ezekiel and out of uh, Leviticus chapter 26, the only aspect of eating flesh was punishment for Israel, was punishment to Israel for not abiding in the ways of the Most High. And he said, I was going to do this to you. And in the history of the nation of Israel, there have been severe famines in the land, in the land and where Israel has been that has caused them to take their babies who were dying from famine and boil them and eat them, 
Lamentations speaks to it. Jeremiah speaks to it. And the Most High speaks to it. Which again reiterates your point, which is that was used for punishment. punishment. That was not used as a way to gain access into eternal life. No, 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 no. Totally diametrically no. opposed. Now, I mentioned to you that the Oxenazis say that there are 613, but I'm going to give you one that's not on any of their lists. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to ask you a question. Is this a misvote? In Vayikra chapter 18 and verse 4, it's the obligation to obey Yahweh's rulings and laws. This is what he says. You are to obey my rulings and laws and live accordingly, semi-comma. That's a period. I am Yahweh, your Eloheka, or your Elohim. You are to observe my laws and rulings. If a person does them, he will have life through them. I am Yahweh. Is that a mitzvah? That's a mitzvah. Not on anybody. It's mm. not. It's not on. It's not on anybody's list. So I guess so. If you're going to tell me six hundred fourteen. So if you're going to tell me there's six hundred thirteen, <laughs> but you left this one off, then there's six hundred fourteen. Right. 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 See. Right. 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 So the aspect of the mitzvahs is centered around this particular mitzvah right here. If you are to obey, and who is he talking to? Hebrew Israel. He's talking to ethnic Hebrew Israel. He's not talking to the The nations. nations. Yep. Yep. Specific. And that is a trait. You are to obey. Our task is to obey. I'm Yahweh. You are to observe my laws and rulings. If a person does them, he will have life through them. Now, there's a key thing right there. See, you're thinking about inhaling and exhaling. The Most High is not talking about inhaling and exhaling. Here. Mm-hmm. He's not talking. He's talking about. So the Greek narrative is I'm going to die and mm-hmm. I'm going to heaven and I'm going to live in heaven the rest of my days. I'm going to walk around heaven all day and do nothing. <laughs> right. Yeah, what it we're so enamored when we were back across the street about just getting there. But then you have to ask yourself the logical question when you get there then what is it going to be like? And I always have wondered that from day 1 is literally who are you going to be listening to? Cuz apparently if you believe in the most high and Christ, then somebody's going to have to take precedent. Exactly. Because you can't do what Christ is asking you and do and serve the most high. Oh, and let me tell you something. Um, according to Torah, because he is not from the Aaronic priesthood mm-hmm. and uh, the best that he could ever be in the land is a Levite because he would be the firstborn of Joseph and Mary. And the firstborn, the firstborn, according to Torah, belongs to the Most High. But even in still in that, doesn't Scripture speak that he couldn't even act in the office of a Levite because he would have to be redeemed with the five, with the silver, five silver, uh, shekels. silver shekels? So he which, couldn't even function which, there. Which there's no narrative at all that Joseph or Mary submitted to the Kohanim of Israel, the five shekels to redeem him. Yeah, that's another point too. You never hear about that. Oh my goodness. It comes, there, there are so many, <laughs> there's so many issues that violate his principle for being who he is. So even in the land, when we get in the land, uh, the Messiah, the Mashiach is not going to be him. It's going to be King David. Mm-hmm. Because he says, he says, King David is my anointed king. The word anointed is the word Moshiach. So he's going to be the Moshiach, the Messiah, and he's going to be the king of Israel in the land forever. We're not going to heaven, people. Mm-hmm. Get that out of your mind. The Most High has promised that he would redeem Israel from all of the four corners of the earth that he has dispersed them and bring them back to the land that he has dispersed them from. 
And he's only going to bring back to the land those individuals that have been dispersed in, into the exile who are right, who have some semblance of righteousness. He's not bringing back wicked people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. What you said was so vibrant for me when you made mention of King David, because, you know, um, it's so refreshing to understand that we will have a leader, a true leader when we get back into the land, because that's been Israel's pattern ever since they've gotten, a matter of fact, ever since the existence of, of, of Hebrew Israel, they've had Moshe, they've had Yahashua, they've had Devorah, they had the judges, they had all these individuals that have come and, and when they fallen away, there was an individual that was a Mashiach that came and, and was their leader for a certain time. And they, they found solace and got back in right standing with the most high. And I think that's what obviously we're missing right now is that strong leadership yeah. to yeah. get us to turn back. Yeah. I know we're just a voice, but I mean, w- the pattern of us is, and almost, I was going to tell you this offline, but it's like, you know, almost, that's almost my, my, my new prayer now to the most high is we need a leader. Yeah. Send us someone. Yeah. To, to get yeah. us to turn back yeah, so because we've seen that renaissance yes, period every right, time we've had right, one. Right, 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 right. Now, is this weakened and effective? By Ecra chapter 19, verse 3, every one of you is to revere his father, his mother, mm. and you are to keep my Sabbaths. I am Yahweh, your Elohim, your Eloheka. Is that weakened and effective? Absolutely not. There's no part of that that's weak. Do not turn to idols by Ecra chapter 19, 4, and do not cast metal gods for yourselves. I am Yahweh, your El Heka. Mm-hmm. See, I mean, all of these are, these are, these are not weak and ineffective statements. Uh, do not steal from or defraud or lie to each other. Um, is that weak and ineffective? How many of you out there want somebody to, to steal from you and defraud you. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have, you'd have a, you would have a hissy fit. Right. You know, if that was, if that was happening to you. You know, hey, you know what? I want to bring something up and you're probably going to piggyback right all over top of this one, but I want to actually help them to say, listen, you've been coming over to our side of the narrative and using something that you really shouldn't be using. If it's weak and ineffective, then you need to go back to your pastor and tell him to stop telling y'all to tithe because that's weak and ineffective too. And that only shows up in Torah. So if that's weak and ineffective, then you shouldn't be tithing. Well, let's, (laughs) let's see if this is weak and ineffective. Um, by equal chapter 19, verse 15, which is the mitzvah to the prohibition to pervert justice. Do not be unjust in judging. Show neither partiality to the poor or difference to the mighty, but with justice judge your neighbor. Um, what's the aspect of Black Lives Matter all about. Oh, okay. Isn't it about justice? Mm-hmm. Is it about the fact that if you're poor and you go to court, you don't get a fair trial, but if you have a lot of money, you can probably beat the case? Mm-hmm. Uh, isn't that <laughs> impartial? Isn't that partial judging? And how many of you like to have and go to court when you know that you're innocent but because somebody has a whole lot of money, they beat the case and you go to jail. Mm-hmm. Uh, but remember, uh, the Torah and the laws, the precepts of the Most High and the laws are under the law, which mm-hmm. don't apply to you. Then tell me, how come you're so angry when you go to court and you don't get a fair trial because you've been you've been impartially dealt with? Mm. Mm-hmm. But it's weak, weak and ineffective. And ineffective. <laughs> example after example after example. Why, why, why do you get so angry in Vayikra chapter nineteen and verse sixteen when somebody slanders you? 
Do not go around spreading lander, slander among your people, but also don't stand idly by when your neighbor's life is at stake. Why are you so angry when someone slanders you? But once again, that's under the law and weak and ineffective. But you get literally upset when you find out that someone has slandered you mm -hmm. and will take them to court for it. Absolutely. And when you go to court, you want a just and fair and impartial judgment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, man, these mitz votes. This mitz votes are 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 very important, and I'm just I'm just scanning through a, a few of them here in terms of uh, of one. Here's a mitz vote that's not on the list. It's in Vayikra chapter 19, verse 19, and it's for 19 says, "Observe my regulations." Do you think observing his regulations is a mitz vote? That's a mitz vote, not on anybody's list. Mm. So 106, 13. Now it's got uh, it's 100, got 615. 15, which again. Reiterating, these are all practical ones that can be done today. We haven't, there's a, a set that, you know, obviously we'll have to do when we get into the land, but this is applicable for you right now. And you're using it right now and you don't even know it. So it's not like it's hard to do. So someone telling you that, you know, uh, you, you, you keeping them all and some of them can't be kept because we're not in the right dispensation of time. But you're not reading anything that you're not doing already. Is this a misvote in Vayikra chapter 19, verse 30? Most High says, keep my Shabbats oh. and re revere my sanctuary. I am Yahweh. Well, you know uh, how to get out of that. How to get out of that one. Huh? You know how to get out of that one. How do I get out of that one? Well, I mean, keep my Sabbath holy. Every day is holy. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> yeah, light that one up. Yeah, well. Is if every day is the Sabbath, then why do you go to work the rest of the week? You right, should, it's still your weekend should be extended for seven days. Right, you should you shouldn't be doing any work. Period. It's, 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 it's a it's a every, rest day. I think <laughs> I was going to say, I think every dodo knows that the Father's <laughs> Sabbath is the is the seventh day, except for the fact that he has high Shabbos, high Sabbatones. That's right. Which, which are the feasts and the festivals that he has. Those are, those are high Sabbaths. They can occur at mm -hmm. any time when they, when they come up. But he says, you are to keep them. I mean, but all of these are weak and in ineffective. Effective. Oh, here's one. So, you go to the store and you buy vegetables mm -hmm. and you put them on the scale, but the scale has been altered in some way. Mm. So now you get to the register and you weigh it out and you thought that on the scale that you weighed it on, it was right, but the scale has been altered. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you feeling? Taken advantage of? Pretty and upset. For and for a lot of you, you you're hot, you're angry, and you're mad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's a mitzvot that's weak and ineffective that's under the law. It says, "Don't be dishonest with measuring length, weight, or capacity." By Ecclesiastes chapter nineteen, verse thirty-five. The most high. Now, once again, these mitzvot are not for the nations; they are written to Hebrew Israel. Right. You know what? I want to address something real quick. Okay. Since we're talking about myths, folks, because, you know, when we were back across the street, I think one of the things that, that we, we talked about the most was the observance of what the 10 commandments, even though there was a lot of talk about the, the, the law being done away with, we, we still harped on the 10 commandments and we probably need to provide clarification let's do, on, on, on that. Let's, what, let's do that. Let's what, do that. Go ahead. What, what you're reading as far as the Ten Commandments are concerned, you got to understand what's happening here. The Most High is meeting with the children of Israel as they have transversed out of Mitzrayim or Egypt, and he's meeting them for the first time, and he's giving them, he's speaking to them, and he says ten things to them. We coin that the Ten Utterances. Those are not the Ten Commandments. You have to get over into Shemot 
chapter 34. And actually, I'm going to start where you actually, we, we, we were talking about a little bit earlier. And it says in 34, I'm going to start at 25. I'm in Shemot, which is Exodus. This is the real Ten Commandments. And I'm just going to read the last, latter part of it. It says, and I'm going to read it actually from the American Standard Version. So this is not the Hebrew because I want you to hear it how you would normally hear it. All right. Thou shalt not offer blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of Passover be left until morning. The first fruits of the ground thou shalt bring unto the house of Jehovah your Elohim. Thou shalt not boil a kid in its mother's milk. And Jehovah said unto Moses, write these words for the tenor of these words. I have made a covenant with thee and Israel. And there was with and he was there with Jehovah 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now, you'd have to read prior, the pretext of that, because there's Ten Commandments prior to that. And I read the latter part of it. And most of them deal with the Moadims. The Moadims are the festivals, the appointed times that the Most High wants to meet with us. They are not even remotely close. Some of them are regurgitated again in the in the ten utterances earlier. I think that's in what? Shemot chapter okay. now, now where where were you reading again? Shake that again? I was in chapter number thirty four uh, of Shemot, which Shemot. is Exodus. And I started at twenty five, which is probably like a commandment number eight, nine, and ten, going all the way down. But I wanted to emphasize that latter part in version number twenty eight where he specifically says these are the Ten Commandments. Now, if you listen to this, you're going to probably be a little confused and you say, how in the world can we have the Ten Commandments in chapter number 34 and prior to this, what we talk about, do not steal, do in not chapter cover 20. Their, chapter 20. They are totally different other than the fact that there's maybe one or two of them that are the same. So the issue is you got to reconcile the two and say, okay, if we've been calling this the Ten Commandments the whole entire time, they're really not the Ten Commandments. In proper context, it's just what the Most High said to the children of Israel. The Ten Main Commandments that he gave them doesn't happen until chapter number 34, which if you're going to do the Ten Commandments, you need to start getting yourself ready to get into those Moedims, those festivals, and those appointed times, which obviously is going to be a problem for you. Because nobody in, in Christendom have a clue what those what, even are. What those even are. Because but, there because there's there's very little mention of them over in the Greek text. Well, other very than little. the there's uh, there's a there's a mention of Passover. Yeah. And that's what you all call the Lord's Supper. Right. There's another one called Shabbat, which you call the day of Pentecost. Pentecost, right. Yeah. Right, but so, other, than, other than that, uh, there aren't the uh, the feast of trumpets is not mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, the day of atonement is not mentioned. I don't think Sukkot is mentioned and either. Sukkot is not mentioned. But they're all a part of the but Ten Commandments. Part of the Ten Commandments. So once again, uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm almost, but I got to go somewhere. Okay, because you just you just we, we made a comparison between. Uh, chapter 34 and chapter 20. Mm -hmm. And people need to understand that chapter 20, uh, where it says, where the 10 can work, where it's enumerated on all, you go to the store, you buy a, a little plaque and it says the 10 commandments <laughs> right. and chapter 20 is listed. Right. Chapter 20 is not the 10 commandments. Chapter 20 is the contract that the Most High made between Israel, his wife, and himself. In Hebrew, it's called the ketubon, right. the marriage contract. Yeah, and at and the end of it, they say, all that you said, we will do. We will do. Which is the same that you say at your, at your wedding vows. Yeah. Now, but he starts out in this context. He says, then Yahweh said all these words, I am Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitraim, out of the out of the abode of slavery? I am, I am, I am. Yeah, nobody am, else, nobody else. I am, and that's always going to be present. Now, watch this. Verse three says, "You are to have 
no other gods before me. Let me put this in context for you, Mm -hmm. husbands and wives. He's saying to you, I'm the one who married you. I brought you out and you are not to have any other husband before me. Period. I, 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 I don't know how emphatic you can be. <laughs> I, I don't know where we are, but I, I got to talk about this for a minute. No, go ahead. You got plenty of time for this. Absolutely. So let's close with this on these myths, folks, okay? You go to the altar and you marry a man your husband and your wife, and you commit, you pronounce vows. Mm -hmm. But in the context of your pronouncing vows, somebody gets loosey-goosey in the relationship Mm. and you have extramarital relationships and you bring another man or you bring another woman into the context. Mm. The Most High says to Israel, You shall not have any other Elohim beside me. You shall not have any other God beside me. And when you do that, I am going to be furious. Mm. Now, I want to ask you a question as we close this podcast tonight. So you come home and you find your wife or your husband in the bed with another person. Uh, How are you feeling? You just, oh, that's okay, baby. Or are you furious? Right. Does your anger flare up? Mm -hmm. That's the most high with Israel Mm -hmm. and his wife because Israel is his wife. Chapter 20 is the marriage contract that he signed with Israel. And at the end of it, Israel said, all you have said, we will do. Will do. do. Mm -hmm. You say, do you promise to love, cherish, and obey until death you do part? Mm -hmm. You say, I will. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and forbidding all others. Mm-hmm. Let no man, let, let what Yahweh has joined together, let no man put asunder. But somebody has come in and slipped in and put it asunder, and now you're furious. What right do you have to become furious? Mm-hmm. After mm-hmm. all, the law of the Most High is weak and ineffective, <laughs> and he doesn't have a right to get angry with his wife, whom he calls a whore, and a prostitute that you've read in the Hebrew narrative. And you have read where his anger has blazed up at the fact that another God has come in the midst of Israel. So now then, if the Most High has to get angry over, has the right to get angry over his wife, you have the right to get angry over yours and the relationship that you have. You have that right. But you don't have that right under Torah if you think that what the Most High has written is weak. And and ineffective and does not bring you to the goal. You'll do the same thing that the Most High did. You'll get kicked kicked out. Mm. My prayer is that I hope that this particular podcast gives you something to think about in terms of the mitzvot. And I've just touched on a few of them. I'm teaching all of the mitzvot in our congregational setting. You can go to FDF. Sound of the Shofar, FTF, YouTube, on our YouTube channel, and you can listen to the teachings of the mitzvot as I narrate them each week, each uh, every every, every other, other week, week mm-hmm. uh, there on the YouTube channel, and you can understand how significantly important that these are to our way of life. Once again, I close this by saying to you, what we're talking about and what we're sharing to you are not for the nations. It's directed to Hebrew Israel. There's no argument. We will not debate, neither will we argue the context on the other side of the street called the Greek text. The Greek text is diabolically opposed Mm -hmm. to the Hebrew text. Mm -hmm. Diabolically. And it is designed to do one thing. Remember, I got to say this. (laughs) I got to say this. If somebody hated you yeah. and didn't like you, mm-hmm. would you allow them to write your biography? Right. Somebody don't like you. Can you write me a letter of recommendation? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> really? And so after four years of silence, you mean to tell me that the Most High wakes up 
and he lets a nation that's defined in Daniel chapter 7 as an antichrist nation or anti-God nation write a narrative to support his people? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Come on, people. <laughs> Use some lot, some common sense and think about that. You don't want anybody writing a narrative for you that don't like you. Why would the Most High want a people to write a narrative for him that don't like him, mm -hmm. which happens to be Greece and Rome. And Rome happens to be the great grandson, the progenitor of Esau, whose desire it is to kill Hebrew Israel mm -hmm. and separate them from their God. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Agreed. Now, here's what it is. The Greek text is bait and catch. So, when you throw a hook into the water and you catch a fish, you hook him. So the Greek text is a hook. You draw the fish in out of the water and he's on deck. The next the next point of his life is death. Right. He's flopping around, gasping for air. And I'm saying to you, for water. And I'm saying to you, the Greek text is death. Mm. And the Most High says, these words that I'm giving you, if you will observe them, they shall be life to you the most high is talking about eternal life mm -hmm. life in the seventh day life in the eighth day mm -hmm. oh there's an eighth oh there's an eighth yeah there's an eighth day the most high has eight eight days it's called new beginnings mm -hmm. this has been rabbi robert b holman jr and sean appleton and this has been hebrews, hebrews in, in exile, exile. shalom, shalom.